Luther once said, if I declare with the loudest voice and the clearest exposition every portion of God's word except for that one little bit which the world and the devil are at the moment attacking, I would not be confessing Christ. Interesting, isn't it? Listen again. If I declare with the loudest voice and the clearest exposition every portion of God's truth except for that one little bit which the world and the devil are attacking at the moment, I'm not confessing Christ. And he's right. Either we're with him or against him. Either we're all the way with him or against him. So the real question for us in these days is, what is, what is that one little portion of truth that the devil is attacking in the last days? What is he attacking now? Let's step back and see the big picture once again. Genesis chapter 3, we discover God had just created the world and he put Adam and Eve in the garden. He told them they could eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden except that one tree in the middle. If you eat from it, God said you're going to die. Well, you know the story. They ate from it. Now God had a dilemma. How can he save them? He doesn't want them to die, but they chose to step outside of that circle according to the way God made them. And the consequences, if you step outside of that circle, you're going to die. They did it. He doesn't want them to die. He loves them. So what could he do? How could he unfold a plan that would enable him to be telling the truth and at the same time save those whom he loves? And then we discover the first prophecy right there in the Garden of Eden. God said to the serpent, chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 15, I'll put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman. And between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now we know that the offspring of the serpent, the serpent being the devil, his offspring, those who choose to follow him. The offspring of the woman, symbolizing God's people, is Jesus Christ and those who are in him. The Bible says that he would receive a wound on the heel. He did when he died on the cross. But praise the Lord, three days later he rose again, ascended to heaven. One of these days he's going to come back and crush the head of the serpent. All the rest of the Bible is unfolding this prophecy. How is God going to finally and ultimately crush the head of the serpent? How is it going to happen? Well, we come to the climax of that prophecy in Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation 12, another bit of background, verse 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough. They lost their place in heaven. Ancient serpent called the devil of Satan who leads the whole world astray was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Bad news for earth. Bad news for us. What's he doing? When he was hurled down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. Now the woman symbolizes God's people. So he pursues the woman who had given birth to the male child. Then in verse 13, when the dragon saw he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. And then verse 17, the dragon was angry at the woman, went off to make war against the rest, or as the King James says, the remnant, the last of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So now we see the climax of that battle, the climax of this conflict where the dragon, the devil, is at war against those who are the last of God's people on this earth. This is it. This is just before the end. So what is the point of attack? What is that one little bit of truth, as Luther said, that if we were not preaching it, we would not be preaching Christ at all? What is it? And he tells us right here, chapter 13, verse 1, I saw the dragon 
stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. So here's the dragon, and he's standing looking out over the sea, and he sees a beast coming up out of the sea. What is the point of attack? The dragon is angry at the woman, went to make war against the remnant of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. The point of attack is the law of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the whole issue in the book of Revelation. That's the issue that's been at the center of this conflict ever since it began in the Garden of Eden. The commands of God and the grace of God, that's the issue. That's the point of attack. And he stands on the shore. How does this battle unfold? He sees this beast come up out of the water. At the end of two, the dragon gave the beast his power, his throne, and great authority. The dragon is the devil. But he never works as the devil. He works through human instruments. And in Revelation 12, we discovered he was the pagan Roman Empire. He was working through the Roman Empire. And it was Rome who gave his authority to the beast. When Constantine gave the bishop of Rome his power, his throne, his great authority, we discover that Rome became a nation, but not just a nation. It was a church, a joining together of the church and state to enforce her doctrines, to enforce her particular brand of worship. How effective was it in verse 8? All of the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast except for those whose names are written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb. That's how powerful almost every person on earth is going to be willing to worship the beast. How? How does it happen? Verse 11, another beast comes out of the earth. Now, this one's the false prophet. We know that. We haven't identified him yet. That's coming up here quicker than you think, but we still don't need to know who he is to see what he does. He has two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. So he looks like a lamb, a Christian power. Remember, a beast is a nation. So here's a Christian nation, a Christian power that looks like a lamb, but he speaks like the dragon, and he made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. How does he do it? Verse 13, two weapons. Verse 13, he performed great and miraculous signs, and by the power of the miracles he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. The second weapon, that he caused all who refused to worship the image to be killed. So the false prophet uses deception, and he uses force. He uses force to try to force with a death decree the world into worshiping the beast. He is so successful that practically the whole world is going to acknowledge Rome's authority and demonstrate that by the way they worship. The whole world, except for those whose names are written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb. We need our names written in that book. Amen. And then in Revelation chapter 14, we discover the answer to the question that was raised in verse 4 of chapter 13. This beast, this power, this church, state, nation is so powerful that men worship the beast asking in verse 4, who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? Who can stand against him? The answer to that question is surprising. The beast is portrayed as a beast with seven heads, ten horns. Horrible looking monster. Who can stand against him? He is so powerful. Who can stand against him? The answer, Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, I looked and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Who can stand against the beast? The Lamb. 
Don't you love it? The lamb. And he's standing on Mount Zion. And with him, 144,000. Anyone who's ever read the book of Revelation has wondered at one point or another, well, who are the 144,000? What does that mean? One person asked me, well, does that mean that only 144,000 people are going to be saved? I'm afraid that leaves me out. Not very many. Well, notice one thing. Remember our principles, our guiding principles in interpreting Revelation. It has to be centered upon Jesus. No private prophecy. We need to let the Scripture interpret itself. Are you with me now? Amen? By comparing Scripture with Scripture. And then the third thing. The book of Revelation quotes the Old Testament over how many times? Over, good, over 600 times. We have to put all this together. Number four, the book of Revelation is a symbolic book. He symbolized what is going to happen in the future. So we have to interpret the symbols and assume that Revelation is symbolic unless it's obviously, that, obviously clear that it isn't. So here's 144,000, the Lamb standing on Mount Zion with 144,000. We know that the Lamb is a symbol, isn't it? I mean, he's not concerned about a real lamb standing on the mountain. The lamb is Jesus Christ. So the lamb is a symbol. Mount Zion. What is Mount Zion? In the Old Testament, and this is very important to see, in the Old Testament, Mount Zion was the temple mountain. That's the place where that was the focal point of Israel's worship. That's where the sanctuary, the temple was. That's where they offered the sacrifices of the lambs. So Mount Zion was the center of Israel's worship. That's where the temple was. But in the New Testament, that temple was destroyed. The sacrifices are ended. Jesus is our Passover. Jesus is our lamb. So what is Mount Zion now? Hold your place in Revelation. Turn to an awesome verse in, Re in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12th chapter, verse 18. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched. Moses went up on the mountain, it could, a real mountain. It could be touched. It was shaking and, and lightning strike. No, you haven't come to that kind of a mountain. Well, what have we come to? Verse 22. You have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of the living God. You have come to the church, verse 23, of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God. You have come to Jesus. Now notice, he's writing to the church, and he's saying, you don't go to a mountain that can be touched a real mountain? No. You come to Mount Zion, the heavenly Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You've come to the church of Jesus Christ. You have come to Jesus. So all of those in the New Testament times, that's us who have come to Jesus, all of us who have come to Jesus have come to Mount Zion. Mount Zion, then, is a symbol in the New Testament for the church of Jesus Christ. You have come to Mount Zion. You have come to the church of the firstborn. So those who come to Christ are on Mount Zion now. You say, well, I don't feel like I'm on Mount Zion right now. No, but you are citizens of Mount Zion right now. You are citizens of the New Jerusalem right now. One of these days when Jesus comes, He's going to take us and we are going to be there physically. But in the meantime, we are legally citizens of the New Jerusalem and we are on Mount Zion because it's a symbol for the church of Jesus Christ. It's like adopting a baby. You can go through all the paperwork. You can pay all the fees. You can sign on the bottom line after months and months of work. And that baby is yours already. But not until you go to where he is and pick him or her up and bring her back into your home. 
and put her in her bed. Now she's, she's finally yours. You see, you sign the papers, she's there already yours, but not yet. Not until you put her in the bed. Now you know she's really yours. Well, we come to Christ. We are citizens right now. Legally, we are citizens in the New Jerusalem. That is your home. You have the deed. You belong there. Not yet, because not until he comes and we're walking on those golden streets. Now we will really be there. And so Mount Zion then is the symbol for the church. Let's go back to Revelation 14. The Lamb is standing on Mount Zion. That's Jesus in the center of His church, right exactly where you'd expect Him to be, isn't it? 144,000, who are they? Well, Jesus, the Lamb is a symbol for Jesus. Mount Zion, a symbol for the church. Then the 144,000 must be a symbol too. Do you want to know what it symbolizes? Amen. Well, keep coming. <laughs> For those of you watching on TV, keep watching. Don't have time to do all that now. Lamb is a symbol. Mount Zion is a symbol for the church. The 144,000 are with him on Mount Zion. What else does it say about them? Verse 4. Or actually, at the end of verse 3, they're singing a song no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Amen. So they have already been redeemed from the earth. Here is a picture, a snapshot of those who are going to be redeemed from the earth, but it's a picture in advance of them. They had been redeemed. So John is looking way into the future, to the end of time, and he sees those who have been redeemed from the earth standing on Mount Zion with Jesus. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. Now that's an interesting one. And then they, here's the best do you want to know who the 144,000 are? This is really all you need to know. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. So who are they? They are the ones who are ultimately going to be redeemed. And John is seeing them in advance on Mount Zion. They're the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They're first fruits of the harvest. Now in the Old Testament, every harvest they had, they would take the first fruit, the first cutting of grain, the cream of the crop, the best, and they would offer that to God. Well, Jesus was the first fruit. Now, those who are in Christ are shown as being with Him, the first fruit of the final harvest when Jesus comes to take His people. Watch. The end of chapter 14, verse 14. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man. Who's that? All right, that's Jesus. And then he had a sharp sickle in his hand. An angel came out of the temple and said, The time to reap has come. Put in your sickle and reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he swung his sickle on the earth, and he harvested the earth. The grain is ripe. Jesus said in Matthew 13, The harvest of the wheat. The harvest is the end of the world. The grain is ripe. Jesus comes to take his harvest. That's what we're looking forward to. Amen? And so the 144,000 are offered as first fruits to God. They're part of the harvest. But there's another harvest in Revelation 14. Verse 17, another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another voice called, a loud voice called out to him with a sharp sickle, take your sharp sickle, gather the cluster of grapes from the earth, because the grapes are ripe. In verse 19, the angel swung his sickle on the earth and he gathered the grapes 
and he threw them in the winepress of God's wrath and they were trampled in the winepress outside the city. So we have two harvests, don't we? A harvest of grain and the harvest of grapes. The grain is the harvest of those who follow the Lamb, Jesus Christ, wherever he goes. The grapes are those who don't follow the Lamb. The righteous, the wicked, the good, the bad, however you want to call them. God's people, the devil's people, those who follow the devil, those who follow Jesus. Two distinct groups at the harvest time. So the harvest is good news for the grain and bad news for the grapes. I don't want to be a grape. I want to be grain, don't you? The grain is ripe. The grapes are are ripe. The harvest time has come. Notice the picture. When Jesus comes, the whole world is divided into two groups, the grain and the grapes, the righteous and the wicked. There is nothing in between. But if Jesus were to come right now, he would discover three groups. The grain, the grapes, and a massive sea of humanity who never even heard anything about God. They didn't know the truth about God. So if Jesus were to come right now at this instant, there would be people who could legitimately say, Lord, we never heard of you. Help us. What are we going to do? We never heard of you, Lord. But it isn't going to be that way when Jesus comes. There will be grapes and there will be grain. Something has to happen to dry up this massive sea of humanity. Remember, we learned from the very beginning that there was only one thing preventing God or Jesus from coming right now. And it was the same thing that prevented him from destroying Adam and Eve and starting over in the Garden of Eden. And it was the same thing that prevented him from destroying that serpent in heaven when he first rebelled against God. Same thing. And that was that if Jesus would have destroyed that serpent right then, then all the rest of the angels and other beings would be worshiping and obeying God out of fear instead of love. So God couldn't do that. Remember, we learned that he had to give Lucifer time to demonstrate what it would really be like if he was on the throne, if he had his way. And so God sent him down to planet Earth. We happen to be the stage for this drama to unfold. And you could say, not fair. I don't want to be in that drama. No, we don't have any choice. No, it isn't fair. There's nothing fair about sin. But the cross more than makes up for the short time that we have to go through here in order to be a part of God's plan to finally and ultimately deliver that death blow to the head of the serpent. And when it's all over with and we look back through what we have been through, we will sing hallelujah. We will sing praise God, just and true are your ways because we will have an experience that no other beings in the universe will have ever been through. I think we'll understand and have a love for God that no one else can fully understand. But in the meantime, Satan has time to demonstrate what his kingdom is like. Now the grapes are ripe. Revelation 14. Now he has shown at that point in time, he will have shown what his kingdom is like. What is it that ripens the grapes? It's the grain. 
You see, the more the grain matures, the more God's people follow the Lamb and demonstrate what it's like to follow the Lamb, demonstrate what it's like to trust God. The more they do that, the more it arouses the wrath of the wicked and they turn against them, demonstrating what it's like when you don't have God. So now we see in Revelation 14, the world has come to a point where God finally has a people that can demonstrate to a sufficient degree what it's like to follow the Lamb, and it brings out the wrath of those who reject the Lamb so that the grapes are ripe, the grain is ripe. It doesn't mean that we are no longer in need of a Savior, that we're so perfect we never make mistakes. It means that we're so close to God that we've shown the world that there is, once and for all shown, there is a better way. Follow the Lamb. It's so much better. And the wicked are showing, ah, here's what happens if you don't so what is it that brings this point about how do we ultimately get there and that's our topic finally the three angels of revelation I've gone all around it like a sandwich 144,000 and then the harvest scene now we're at the middle of the two but we have to understand this. The book of Revelation is not written in chronological order. The book of Revelation is written by Jews, even though they use Greek to write. They were Jews and they thought like Jews. And the Jews think in what we call parallel principles. But in the parallel principle, what they'll do, they'll give you the big picture of what happens and then they go back and fill in the details of how it got there. The 144,000 on Mount Zion with the Lamb. That's the big picture. They are redeemed. They have been redeemed. They're there. That's what the John sees is going to be in the future. How did they get there? Now he comes back and shows how it happens. It's like, if I can use a worldly illustration, it's like watching a football game on television. I mean, some of you have done that, huh? So let's suppose the quarterback steps back and throws a long touchdown pass. What is the next thing you see on the screen? I heard it. Instant replay. Instant replay. The cameras go back and show you what happened. Usually it's not exactly the same thing you just saw. Usually they'll go back and show you from a different angle or perspective. Maybe they'll show the lineman blocking or the receiver running his route, or the quarterback getting clobbered before he has a chance to finish. And when you put all of these instant replays together, then you can see the whole picture of what happened on that play. Well, that's the way Revelation is. He gives you the big picture, the broad sweep, and then he comes back and saying, here is how it happened. The Lamb, 144,000 on Mount Zion, how did they get there? Well, there was the three angels' messages, and then the harvest scene. Then they're on Mount Zion. See, he comes back to fill in the details. So here we are. How did they get there? In chapter 14, verse 6. I saw another angel flying in the midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Now here's another point that we need to make. Revelation is a symbolic book. Remember, it's symbols. Here he shows an angel flying through the air preaching the gospel. Jesus never commissioned angels to preach the gospel he told the church you he said go and preach the gospel to the whole world teach them all things baptize them and so angel the Greek word angel angelos really means messenger the angel is God's messenger to the world in the last days God's messenger is his church he shows it as an angel flying through heavens to demonstrate, to symbolize the importance and the urgency of this last message 
that God has entrusted to the church before Jesus comes. So let's look at it. What is the message? The everlasting gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth. What is the gospel? The good news. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And this message goes to the whole world. The fact that God demands perfect obedience to his law. Because if we break the law and step outside of that circle, we're going to die. But the problem is we can't keep the law. Jesus did. He lived his whole life inside the circle. He died on the cross in your place. And he rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven. He's going to come back. If we confess our sins if we repent of our sins Jesus forgives us and looks at us as though we had never sinned and then he gives us the perfect life that he lived while he was here on this earth and that's our title to heaven that's the gospel So this angel has the good news about Jesus the everlasting gospel same gospel that was preached in the Old Testament is the gospel that we preach today. But there's something unique about this gospel. Not the message. The message of the gospel never changes. And that is that you're saved by grace through faith in Jesus. That will never change. But there is something different about this proclamation of the gospel of the first angel. What is it? Listen. He had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth. Who does he preach to? Every nation, tribe, language, and people. Who does that leave out? Every living being on this earth is going to have the opportunity to hear the truth about God before Jesus comes. Every living being. No one will be able to say, God, I didn't know. I never heard before. No one. Because every nation, tribe, language, and people are going to have the opportunity to hear the good news about Jesus before he comes. No excuses. Not everyone's going to listen, but they'll have an opportunity to hear. But what is the difference about this gospel and all the others before? No difference in the gospel. Here comes the point that I was trying to make. He said in a loud voice. Did you hear that? He said in a loud voice. Sometimes people ask me, Preacher, why do you preach so loud? Well, I don't know if you noticed it or not, but every place in Revelation where God has something important to say, He says it in a loud voice. Well, I have something important to say. So I have a loud voice. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory because the hour of His judgment has come. That's it. The hour of His judgment has come. Up until this time, no one could say, Here's the gospel because the hour of God's judgment has come. But now... We're looking at a time when those preaching the gospel can say, the hour of God's judgment has come. James, in James chapter 2, said, Speak and act as those who are going to be judged in the future by the law. But John sees a time when the gospel is preached in the setting of the hour of God's judgment has come. So something happened between what John saw and what James wrote. And that is that it is now the judgment hour. So we're looking ahead from John's point of view to the judgment hour. And I'm going to show you we are living in the judgment hour right now. So we're looking to our own time and the gospel is being preached for the hour of God's judgment has come. If there was ever a time that we need the gospel of Jesus Christ, that time is during the judgment hour. Amen? Amen. So fear God. Remember, this is the same time. That the beast is doing his work. And the whole world is scared of the beast saying, who can stand against him? So God has a voice. God has a people that says, fear God, not the beast. Maybe he can take your life on earth. But there's more. There's more. Second angel followed and he said, oh, I'm about to skip the most important part here. I don't want to do that. He said, he said, fear God, give him glory. The hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So 
just at this right time, and I'm going to show you coming up here, it started about the time Darwin published his book, The Origin of Species. God would have a people that would go to the whole world and say the everlasting gospel, announce the hour of God's judgment has come, a sense of urgency, worship God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Worship the creator. The beast is just a creature. Don't be afraid of the beast. Worship the creator. Fear God. Now the fear of the Lord is not like, I'm scared of God. The fear of the Lord is to stand in awe of God. A God who is just, who can't allow people who don't trust Him to live their lives in a certain way that hurts other people. He can't allow that to go on and on forever. He is just. He will put an end to sin. But He's a God who has demonstrated by sending His own Son to die on the cross that He loves you. And no one needs to be lost. Amen. We stand in awe of a God like that. Not to be afraid. But the Bible says it's his strange act when he finally destroys the wicked. One day, I was visiting out with a pastor. He came to pick me up to go out and visit some people. And uh, when we were getting in the car, I saw my neighbor's dog. And he was shaking. You know how dogs get something in their mouth and they shake their heads hard? He had this black, fluffy thing in his mouth. And he was shaking his head like that. So I went over to take a look, and it was just a teeny little black baby kitty and I got angry and I had a stick and I grabbed that dog and I began the beating with a stick and I would have beat him until he dropped dead if he wouldn't let that little kitty go you see sometimes God looks down and he sees the devil beating up on you. He sees him doing everything he can to get you discouraged, to give up, to hurt you. And one of these days, God's going to say, devil, that's enough. I did all that I can do. The grain is ripe. The grapes are ripe. I'm coming. It isn't because he wants to destroy anyone, but true love can't allow the suffering to go on forever. Amen. Praise God for that. Amen? Amen? So God is a God of love. And then the second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She's made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Babylon has fallen that on Mount Zion men worship the creator of the heavens and the earth. Babylon, since Babylon has fallen, in Babylon men worship the creature who is the beast. And that's why the third angel says, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on the forehead of the hand, he will also drink the wine of God's fury, poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He'll be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the angels and the Lamb. Smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There's no rest day and night for those who worship the beast. Interesting. Those who worship the beast, no rest. Those who worship God, rest. wonder why he said it that way. But now we can see that it isn't enough to just proclaim the truth. It isn't enough to just say the gospel. Jesus loves you. He died for you. It's not enough because John and God knew the time was coming. God knew it was going to happen when there would be so many false prophets proclaiming a false gospel that he needed someone to point out the difference between truth and error. And it isn't a coincidence that it's happening at a time when practically everyone now is saying that if you teach that someone is wrong, especially their religion, their faith, then you're hateful. But I would rather let somebody know that they're being led down the wrong path and be called hateful than to just let them go. And that's why God said he has three messages and then a warning. If you don't listen... If you do worship the beast, some bad things are going to happen that you really don't want. 
please worship the Creator. It's God pouring His heart out. You see, the three angels' messages force the whole world to either one side or the other. Follow me. The beast is doing miracles, deceiving people into acknowledging his authority over God's. And the whole world's going for it. Not just with deceptions, but with a death decree, we learn. Worship the beast or you'll die. So you see, there can be no straddling the fence. No, sometimes people tell me, Pastor, I don't know what to do. You know, I've been studying the Bible. It's just so much different from everything that I've been taught, and yet it's true. I can read it in there, but I, I can't change. I, I've been doing this too long. I can't make up my mind. I can't decide. Can you help me? Bless your heart. If you can't decide, somebody else is going to do it for you, and it won't be God because he doesn't force. Only the beast forces. So worship the beast or you'll die. That's going to go to the whole world. There'll be no straddling the fence anymore. Oh, well, I don't know what to do. Bang! You're gone. Worship the beast or you'll die. But at the same time, the third angel says, but if you worship the beast, you're separating yourself forever from the love of God. Now, they may take our lives here on this earth but they can't take our place up there. But folks, you have to believe that by faith. The time is coming when you may see people die because of their faith. And the only way we can know that, hey, if I die here, I have a place up there, is by faith in Jesus Christ. That's why we have to spend time in this book. The whole battle is over faith and trust in God. And so this is God's way of forcing the whole world to decide. He will never force you to love him. He'll never force you to worship him. But you will be forced to choose. And that's what the mark of the beast is all about. It's all about those who try to straddle the fence. Now it's time to, like they say, either fish or cut bait. It's decision time. But I just want to go back for a moment and review the gospel of Jesus Christ because we've talked about some hard things and I like to leave on a positive note. My favorite place, my favorite text that talks about the gospel, that's the first angel's message. It is by grace, Ephesians 2, you know that one, verse 8. It is by grace you've been saved through faith, not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works. Praise the Lord, hallelujah, amen. You can't be good enough. That's why it's by grace through faith in Jesus. So that no one can boast. Because we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We're saved by grace through faith. Everybody knows that verse, but what about verse 10? We're saved by grace in order to do good works. We're not saved because of good works. We're saved by grace, but we're saved by grace in order to do good works. You see, in Hebrews chapter 8, he says it about as plainly as he can when he's talking about that temple and the sanctuary. He said in chapter 8, verse 8, God find fault with the people. The fault wasn't with the promise of the covenant God made in the Old Testament. No, the fault was with the people. And he said, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Now, we know the house of Israel is the church of Jesus Christ. And so he's saying, now in the, old, in the New Testament times, so the new covenant is with the church, but it's with the house of Israel. That's the church. Are you beginning to see how all these pieces fit? This is the covenant, verse 10, that I'll make with the house of Israel. After that time, says the Lord, I'll put my laws in their minds. I'll write them on their hearts. In the Old Testament, they had them written on stone. Now in the New Testament, when we come to Christ, in the New Testament on Mount Zion, he puts them in our heart. The same law that was written on stone, he writes in our heart. That means he creates within us a new desire to follow the Lamb. Well, we're saved by grace through faith in order to live a life that trusts God and stays within the circle. We're not saved because we stay in the circle. We can't stay in. We're already outside. 
He puts us in. And we stay in because we trust him, because we love him by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So we keep the Sabbath not in order to get saved, but because it's written in our heart. It was in stone, now it's in our heart. And we have a desire to rest in God and enter into his rest. Those who worship the beast never get that. We do. Amen. But the gospel, I think, is more than that. We've learned that the gospel, when God writes his law in our hearts, it's not just the letter of the law. The gospel embraces the spirit of the law. The person who follows the letter of the law thinks they're obedient. They never murdered anyone. Jesus said, I got news for you. If you get angry, you've murdered. So that's the spirit of the law. And the, the spirit of the law is far more and far more far reaching than the letter of the law. Look at Titus. And the reason I'm going to do this now is because we're looking ahead to a time when the deceptions and the force will be overwhelming for those on this earth to worship the beast. The whole world's going to go after him except for a few. We want to be among the few whose names are written in the book of life. Amen? Amen. And so now I want to talk about what is it going to be like? Those who follow the three angels' messages, what are they going to be like? What can they do to strengthen themselves or let God strengthen them to be strong enough to stand against the beast? In verse 11, a little book of Titus, chapter 2, verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. That's Jesus. But watch this. Here's the gospel, the grace of God. Verse 12, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age while we wait for the blessed hope that is the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has given himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness, purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These then are the words you should teach, encourage and rebuke with all authority, and don't let anyone despise you. So the gospel is more than just a little tickly good feeling we get when we accept Jesus. The gospel teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion, to live upright lives now in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope. What is the blessed hope of the church? He tells us the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. So we're, while we the church are waiting for the glorious appearing of Jesus, the gospel teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion and live an upright life. What is the ungodliness? What is the worldly passion the gospel teaches us to say no to? Well, you don't have to go far. Just look at the marquees at the neighborhood theater. Well, don't look at them. You don't really need to. You know what's there. The filth, the immorality, the godlessness that's portrayed on the movie screens today are the things that the Bible is teaching us to say no to. The movies portray drugs, crime, violence, immorality, homosexuality, unfaithfulness as something that's normal, natural. And God says, flee from it all. And I want you to know that the Hollywood script writers do not have your spiritual well-being in mind when they plan a movie. And I believe that as Christians, it's time that we stand on our guard and watch what we put into our minds because the devil is trying to do everything that he can in order to deceive you into thinking that wrong is right and right is wrong. Modern music, again, songs about demons and immorality, cheating, I, I, uh, well, let me show you. I found this newspaper article years ago. Boy, I can imagine what the guy would be saying now. 
This was about Madonna. You heard of her, huh? The material girl. Going too far is the title. She had just put out a new uh, DVD, and uh, there was a lot of controversy about it. In fact, even MTV wouldn't show it. That must have really been bad. So I said, how far will she go? Well, this particular Hollywood critic said, after talking about the uh, news, the, the TV, primetime TV programs going more and more towards nudity, even in prime time. Now, he says, comparing this to Madonna, what is happening on the fringe is influencing the center. This is profound. You really need to get this. While the public might not want Madonna's antics on primetime television, it changes the overall paradigm and it paves the way. In other words, the worse it gets out on the fringe, the more acceptable things seem that were not seen as acceptable before. This is a movie critic writing. And this was 15 years ago. What would he say today? And yet I see Christians going to watch these same movies, listening to the same kind of music, and I even hear it sometimes at Christian socials. It reminds me of a poem I heard one time. Vice is a monster, so fightful and mean to be hated. It need only be seen, but seen too often we become familiar with its face. First we abhor, then we endure, then we embrace. And it's so true. Ask yourself, are you watching things today you never would have watched five years ago? I think it's time that we start paying attention to what we put into our minds. What else can we do? How can we be prepared? Turn to... 1 Corinthians. And remember, keep it in the context. We're not trying to figure out what we can do to make ourselves acceptable to God. That's a done deal. Jesus already did it. What do we want to know? We want to know what can we do to enhance and strengthen our walk with God to be able to distinguish the difference between the counterfeit and the truth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him because God's temple is sacred and you're that temple. God wants us to watch what we put into our bodies because our bodies are the temple of God. Here's another one in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 this, this time in the, the last verse of the chapter, 20. He says, you're not your own. You're bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Take care of your bodies. You're not your own. Jesus paid for you. And then in chapter 10, verse 31, whatever you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. Three times here in this letter, he's letting us know that our bodies are important. They're an important part of who we are. God made us with a body, and everything that he made was very good. One lady said, well, this isn't anything. It's just a sack that holds my soul. So what verse is that? In Genesis, it says that God created the man and woman with a body, and God said everything that he made was very good. And he wants us to take care of our bodies because our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and that means that what we put into our bodies matters to God because what we put into our bodies determines how much we can understand and commune with God. The Holy Spirit lives in me. Jesus lives in me. He doesn't want to smoke cigarettes, so why do I force him to do it? He doesn't want to get stoned on drugs and marijuana and other... So why do I make him do it? He lives in me. You see what I'm saying? He doesn't want to get boozed up on alcohol and, and pickle his brain. And why do you want to do it? The time is coming, the Bible says, when we're going to need to determine the difference between truth and error and it's going to take every brain cell we have. Why do we want to destroy them with few fleeting moments of pleasure? One day a man, rough week, came home and said, Look, I, I don't want to do anything. I just want to go home and sit in my big easy chair, put my feet up in the fireplace and read the paper, relax. But he had two little kids. He knew that wasn't going to happen. So he got the bright idea 
on the way home, he would stop and at his favorite Walmart or Kmart or whatever kind of mart you live in, wherever you are in the world watching, and he bought a puzzle. But he checked the age. You know, every puzzle has an age limit on it. So he checked the age group to make sure that it was older than his kids. So feeling smug, he comes home, and they sure enough come running to the door. Daddy, Daddy, let's play. Let's play. Oh, yeah, fine. We're going to play. But here, I brought you a present. What is it? What is it? Here, it's a puzzle. Map of the United States. Now, go upstairs and put it together. When you finish, you come down, and we'll play. So they ran upstairs. He sits in his easy chair in front of the fireplace, puts his feet up and reads the paper, all relaxed, ready for a relaxed evening, when just a few minutes later, they come running down the steps. Daddy, Daddy, we're done feeling sabotaged. He said, who helped you, your mother? No, 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 we did it all by ourselves. We did it, we did it. Well, how'd you do it? They said, well, we got that puzzle out and it was a map and we don't know where all those pieces went. We don't know the states. But one of the pieces turned over and it was a man's ear. And we turned another one over and it was a nose. And another one was an eye and a mouth. And we kept turning the pieces over and putting the man's face together. And when we got that all done, turned the puzzle over and it was finished. <laughs> See, and some people focus on this piece or that piece and what they eat, what they drink, what they wear, what day they go to church. And they think that if they do all these things, that makes them holy and righteous and good. And then the others say, oh, no, it doesn't matter about those things. Eat what you want, drink what you want, go where you want, do what you want. Any old day will do. But those who focus on the man's face and spend their time thinking about Jesus will discover what to do and what not to do because they love him and they trust him. You see, the whole idea is to turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Follow the Lamb.